So hello, uh, welcome to my second lecture. Um, today I'm going to talk about some more details uh, regarding Fiasco and FORE, uh, especially about two mechanisms I left out in the last lecture, which are going to be uh, memory management and inter-process communication. And in between, I'm also going to give you some introduction to the F4 runtime environment and some more details about how to use it. Um, so, let's see. So far, I told you a bit about microkernels and that we here in Dresden are developing the Fiasco OC microkernel. And I already told you that threads are the abstraction for abs uh, execution in, a, in Fiasco ex OC. But with only thread threads, we don't get very far. And so we need some more fundamentals. So threads need to communicate in order to achieve some service. And even if we can communicate between threads, there's still the issue of managing memory of a process. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I told you that threads are the basic building blocks and that in order to create a working operating system on top of the SQOC, we need to implement servers and these servers are actually threads running in different address spaces and uh, they need to communicate to achieve whatever goals they want. So, and this communication may be in different flavors, so there may be a communication to exchange data between threads. Sometimes you use it for synchronization, which is basically what I showed you last uh, lecture in the end uh, regarding critical sections. Uh, we also use uh, IPC to perform sleeping, um, we use communication handle interrupts and to manage resource access as well. Uh, the communication mechanism provided by Fiasco OC is called Interprocess Communication, or short IPC, and uh, it's kind of the one single most important uh, mechanism provided by a microkernel usually, and Jochen Liebke, the inventor of L4, uh, once uh, phrased it that IPC performance is the master. And what he referred to was that for all design decisions that you're making when building a microkernel, you should always consider that IPC performance is the most important thing, and every design decision you make should be made in a way that the IPC performance uh, gets better, or at least does not get hurt by your decision. So in the first part of my lecture today, I'm going to show you how to implement or how to use IPC from your code, how to integrate it with uh, your language environment, and we're also going to see how we can make it a bit faster. So when we design an inter-process communication subsystem, we have a couple of design decisions to make. And the first one is uh, to make, uh, to decide whether we want asynchronous or synchronous IPC. And um, asynchronous IPC, like it is used for instance in the Mach microkernel, is um, some kind of a fire and forget messaging system. So you send a message and uh, the receiver does not wait for a message. Uh, you just send the message to the kernel and then you continue with whatever you're doing right now. And the kernel will make sure that the receiver will actually eventually receive the message. And um, this has some advantages. For instance, you don't need to care about whether your uh, other side is ready to receive a message right now. However, there are a couple of um, counter or uh, problems with that. And one of the problems is that um, because you're not relying on the receiver being ready to receive a message, you need to copy the message first from the sender thread into the kernel, and later on you need to copy it out of the kernel to the receiver thread again, which is at least one copy you could say. Uh, the other disadvantage is that if you're building your system um, not very carefully, then you might uh, make it prone to denial of service attacks because um, you can then build user applications that send asynchronous messages and go on sending and sending and sending and no one will ever receive this message and thereby you can basically run out of kernel memory because the kernel needs to store this message in between somewhere and so for every new message sent the kernel needs to allocate memory and if you do this often enough then the kernel will run out of memory. However, of course, you can design your kernel in a way that this does not happen. Um, the other uh, alternative for designing APC is synchronous IPC. And this is what it's, what it's done in F4. And synchronous IPC means that the sender as well as the receiver are ready for, uh, commu need to be ready in order to com uh, communicate with each other. This means that if you send a message and your receiver is not ready yet, then you're going to be blocked until the point that the receiver becomes ready. 
and in the other way around, the receiver starts receiving and will be blocked until the point uh, where a sender is sending a message to it. Um, this solves the issues with asynchronous IPC because we don't do any double copy anymore because we know the sender and the receiver are ready to communicate so we can directly copy the message from the sender to the receiver and save one copy for every communication. And also there is no kernel memory involved because we're directly communicating uh, or di directly copying from sender address space to receiver address space so there is no denial of service uh, on the kernel as well. Um, the problem with it uh, design decision is that, of course, you now need to write your system in a way that can cope with uh, the need for partners to synchronize. And it sometimes makes implementing a client-server setup a bit harder when you require both the server and the client to be ready to communicate at certain points in time. Um, on the other hand, it makes other decisions easier. For instance, we can implement the uh, locking scheme I presented to you in the last lecture using this approach. So it's always a matter of uh, weighing the pros and cons, and we decided to use synchronous IPC. Um, so, let's go on. IPC and Fiasco comes in a couple of flavors. Um, the most, most basic ones are on the left side. And there is one IPC operation that allows you to send a message from a sender to a specific receiver. And this IPC flavor is called SEND, for obvious reasons. Um, then there's the other direction where you want to you as uh, want to receive a message from a specific sender, which is called the receive from or a closed wait. And this is called a closed wait because you wait for a message from a specific sender. You specify this is the thread I want to receive a message from and no one else. Um, there's an opposite to that called open wait, which is uh, you are the receiver and you can say I want to receive a message from anyone and I don't care who this is. And this, you, you need both of these things when building systems. Um, so, for instance, if you're implementing a server, then you will use a receive any to wait for a client to send you a message, and you don't know which client this is going to be, so uh, you can't specify which one it is. However, from the client perspective, you send a message to a server, and then you want to wait for the answer from the server. This means you need to specify, I want to receive an answer exactly from this sender and from no one else. Um, as we're talking about client-server IPC, there are actually um, two, specific, uh, two more specific cases uh, which have been implemented especially to implement client-server communication because this is the uh, single most common thing we do and they basically combine two operations, a send and a receive. And for the client side, there is the green uh, stuff which is called an IPC call which is basically a, combina a combination of sending a message to someone and immediately becoming ready to receive the answer from this specific uh, thread. And so this is like uh, a very efficient operation for implementing remote procedure calls, basically. So you send a message, including parameters, the server does some computation and then immediately sends you the answer and you as the client are blocked until the server sends the answer because you need to wait for the result. Um, in the other direction, there is a combined operation for service as well, which is called reply and wait. And reply and wait is basically um, you as the server already received a message from a client, you did some computation, and then you perform a send to this client, sending the reply, and immediately become ready to receive the next um, message from some other client maybe. And again, this is also for efficiency reasons because that's the usual operations servers do. They usually send a reply to the last client they service and then wait for the next message. And so there is, there is a combination of those two um, functions in one system call on top of Fiasco. Um, here's how you basically use IPC in Fiasco OC. Uh, there's a special kernel object to, do for, to use, which is called an IPC gate. And in order to create an IPC gate, um, you basically execute something like this. Um, we have some L4 factory which we get from our L4 environment and then uh, we can call a function called create gate on this factory which is um, used to create an IPC kernel object and we pass in a couple of parameters. Let's have a look at this in more detail. Um, so the first thing we see here is uh, the factory itself and the factory is a kernel object itself. It's not, it's not an IPC gate, it's a different kernel object. And this is the kernel object to create other kernel objects. That's why it's called a factory. 
And um, the reason why you have such a kernel object is that you may use this, for instance, to uh, perform accounting or to limit uh, the ability of certain threads to uh, create certain kernel objects. You could, for instance, say, I never want this thread to create any new IPC gates, so you can never establish new communication sessions with the outside world. Um, and that's why we have factory. And by default, there is a default factory which links you directly to the kernel and allows you to create kernel objects as long as there is a um, kernel quota. And this is the factory object you get from your F4 uh, environment. Which brings me to the next point. We have this L4E dot, uh, colon colon n colon colon n, which is kind of reverse. Um, this is the function to actually obtain uh, a pointer to your environment in C++ code. And then this environment has uh, a member called factory, which then gives you the uh, access to the fa actual factory object. And using the, this first line of code, you will get a pointer to a factory object, which you can then use to create new kernel objects. Let's move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, so factory create gate uh, receives basically three arguments. There's the target capability, which is the capability you want to use for this uh, object. There's the thread capability, and there is a label. And I think I mixed up the slides here. I'd like to start with this slide first. Um, so I told you last time that all objects you use in Fiasco are referred to by capabilities. And so if you want to create a new object, you also need a new capability for this object. And capabilities are nothing more than entries in the per task capability table the kernel manages. And the user uh, who creates a new uh, capability or a new object needs to specify which capability this object should be assigned to. And the most common case uh, you do this is you use a function called l4re util cat -alloc -alloc. And this simply allocates you a new slot in your um, capability table. And what this cat allocator basically does is manages a bitmap that figures out which entries in your capability table are already used by objects and which are not. And if you call alloc, then it will um, give you one of the free items and you can then use it. Um, so basically by calling the cap allocator, you get a new free entry in your capability table. And this is the first parameter to create gate, because this way you tell the kernel that you want to uh, create a new object and want to assign it to this capability slot. Um, the second parameter is um, a thread capability, which is the thread that is going to be bound to this IPC gate. Um, IPC gates are basically unidirectional communication channels, so that you can send in one direction, but not in the other. And there's always a thread bound to an IPC gate. And this thread is the one that is allowed to receive messages through this gate. Everyone else who has a capability can send messages to this channel. However, only the thread that is bound to the gate can receive messages through it. And this is what the second parameter is for. And the third parameter is what I have a separate slide for. It's called a label. Um, and the point here is that the label basically is a integer value that is stored along with the IPC gate object inside the kernel. It's kind of like four bytes you can use and write with arbitrary data. And what you usually do is when creating an IPC gate, you assign it a unique identifier, uh, which is called the label. And this unique identifier can then be used to have a thread waiting for messages on multiple IPC gates. So you can create, for instance, one communication channel for every client you want to serve as a server, and then you need to have some way of distinguishing um, those uh, mess the messages you receive through those channels. And this is what the label is for, because with every message you receive through a communication channel, you will also receive the label through which uh, channel this uh, message has been sent. And this label is set during creation as well. Okay, so let's move on. Basically, once you've created such an IPC gate, you can use it. Um, from the receiver side, um, you can do something like an open wait using your UTCP. Um, so the important part here is then when, when you do an IPC operation, especially when you do a receive operation, you never specify the capability to an IPC gate. Instead, you specify the UTCP you want to use for waiting, which basically means uh, you specify the thread that's doing the wait, and all channels that this thread is bound to will then be able to uh, send messages to this thread. Um, and 
receiving is of course blocking because we're doing asynchronous, uh, we're doing synchronous IPC, and this means you're going to be blocked until the next message arrives, and then you can use the label as I just described to figure out through which of the communication channels uh, this message has been sent. Um, as the sender side, um, if you're the server, um, you have the problem that again you, you've been listening to multiple IPC gates and uh, you, you know through which the message arrived but I told you already that IPC gates are one way and you cannot simply send a message to this gate in the, uh, as a reply. So what you have or what you need to have in a complex system would have enough to be another IPC gate or another channel to the, the client which you can use to send your reply. Which is of course not that a good idea because you'd have to manage two channels for all communication uh, connections and it's kind of hard. And so there's an optimization in Fiasco OC which uh, stores the capability of the last thread who sent you a message inside the kernel until you perform the next receive operation. And this means as a server you can receive a message and then handle this message and then this, the, and the kernel will store a capability to whoever sent you this message. And then you can use this so-called reply capability um, to send the reply without having an external communication object or communication channel to this sender. Um, so far to high level view on using IPC. Um, in order to understand what's going on if we do IPC we need to have a closer look at the user level thread control block which I already told you about in the last lecture a bit because this is what's used for using uh, for storing kernel or system call parameters. And uh, in more detail, uh, the user level thread control block is laid out like this and has basically three areas. The first part are the message registers, which are used to store everything that you want to directly send to the kernel. So for in general, for a system call, this includes uh, any system call parameters you, you might want to use. And uh, in terms of IPC, this contains uh, all data that is going to di be directly copied to the receiver. So you can use the message reg registers to store some message, and then when you do IPC, the receive the message the this message will di be directly copied to the receiver through TCP, and he can then read it from his message reg registers. Um, the second part of the UTCP are the buffer registers which are used to uh, store something called flex page descriptors. And I'm going to explain you later on what flex page descriptors actually are. Um, the short point here is that buffer registers contain uh, kind of resource descriptors which um, allow you to send uh, specific or uh, allow you to hand over access to a resource to someone else. And the third part of the UTCB is actually the smallest part, which are the thread control registers and they are used to store certain thread private data and they are only preserved by the kernel across system calls uh, and they are never copied when you do an IPC between two threads. So this is just some private area that you can use to store certain thread local data. Think of it as some kind of thread local storage provided by the kernel. Um, in addition to storing your message on the UTCP, you need to specify a so-called message tag when you want to um, send an IPC message and this message tag uh, defines or describes the message you stored in your UTCP. You basically described how many of the items you stored in your message registers are valid, how many things you want to, or how many resources you want to specify to hand over and so on. And the important parts are the protocol, the items in the words field. Um, the protocol specifies some kind of user-defined uh, message type. We saw that in the last, uh, last lecture's example on uh, printing someone to the serial console uh, that where we specified the protocol to be uh, the console protocol and you can use this to implement arbitrary protocols yourself so this is a 16-bit number and so you can have like 32,000 different protocol IDs and you can use this when building your system uh, to distinguish between the different kinds of uh, client-server communications that are going on in the system. Uh, the words and items fields describe how many uh, items in your message registers and buffer registers in the UTCP are valid. So, for instance, the words field describes how many words in the message registers should really be copied when doing the IPC between the sender and the, uh, the receiver. 
Um, and the, the items field describes how many uh, flex page descriptors you put into your buffer registers. Um, I can see, in addition to simply copying a message and some resources between uh, sender and receiver, comes with some special features. Uh, one of those features is that IPC has timeout. And this timeout allows you to specify the maximum amount of time you want to wait for your IPC partner to become ready. So when you send a message to someone, you can say, I want to wait at most five seconds and not more in order to uh, have my message uh, arrive. Otherwise, you return with an error. Uh, and on the server side, you can do a similar thing. Say, I want to wait only five seconds. And if there is no client, then I want to return and do some other handling, whatever. Um, the most commonly used timeouts, however, are a timeout zero, which means I want to either send it immediately or not at all, or a timeout never, where you say, I don't care about time, I just want to have this message sent and I want to block until it is done, regardless of how long it will take. Um, as we saw, there are IPC flavors that allow you to uh, combine a send and a receive phase, so for instance, IPC call, and for those, you can specify separate timeouts for the send and the receive phase. So you can, for instance, send with timeout zero and receive with timeout never or something like that. Um, in addition to being kind of handy or, uh, in order to never run in infinite blocking loops because of IPC never arriving, uh, timeouts also have the nice feature that you can use them to implement sleep because um, you can simply specify an invalid capability or a non-existing threat for your IPC, which means there is never uh, someone going to be ready to receive your message. Uh, and you simply do a uh, send to this non-existing threat, specifying a certain timeout. And this basically means the kernel will block you until the timeout runs out. And this is exactly what Sleep does. So this uh, we implement Sleep and L4 using timeouts in IPC. The other interesting feature of IPC are exceptions. And there's just some kind of special flavor of message that the kernel can generate. So, so far, we always thought of communication going on between a sender and a receiver thread. However, there are some situations where the sender can actually be non-existent and instead the kernel will set up an IPC message that is then delivered to someone. And this is used by the kernel to notify user-level threads when something exceptional happens in the system. And we will later today see that this is used for page fault handling, because whenever a page fault arises, the kernel sets up a page fault message and sends it to some user level thread who is responsible for handling that. And it's also used in virtualization in order to send virtualization exceptions. So for instance, if you have hardware virtualization and your guest operating system is need needed to handle a system call, then this, this will generate a virtualization fault and the kernel will set up a message sent to this fault to a respective fault handler containing some additional information um, regarding to that. But more, uh, to, more about that in the third lecture on Tuesday. Um, so now with all this knowledge, we can happily go on and write IPC code. So here's some uh, C example code, which looks pretty similar to what I showed you in the last lecture. It's kind of a bit different, uh, but uh, the basic things we need to do are the same. So we have a function here uh, called foo of one call, whatever that means. It's just a function. And this function receives a couple of arguments. And this, uh, there's a capability to uh, a destination, or to a destination channel I want to send a message to. And there are two parameters. Uh, argument one I want to send is an integer value. And the second argument is pointed to a character and a size which basically means that there is some kind of a string in here with a pointer to the string and the size of the string. And what I, then, what I then need to do in order to send this as a message is I need to put these arguments into my UTCB and then at some point trigger an IPC set. And putting this into the UTCB means basically I need, I need to get access to my message registers down here and then uh, have an index into the message registers to know where I want to write to. And so I start with index zero, and the first thing I write in there is I write some kind of opcode in. So if you know about remote procedure call, then you know that uh, in remote procedure call, all messages are somehow put into a buffer and then sent over the network to someone else who's going to handle this remote procedure call. And the server you're talking to is usually providing you with more than just one function. In order to distinguish the function you want to uh, want the server to execute, you need to have some kind of identifier for this function. And this function, this is usually called an opcode, 
And this is what we see here. So we have an operation op1, and op1 needs to be identified by some kind of distinct opcode. That's the first thing we put into the message registers. The second thing we put in there is our first argument, which is an integer, and we can simply uh, directly copy it in there. And then we need to additionally copy this uh, second parameter, uh, where we need to use main copy again um, to copy uh, the buffer into the message registers starting at index 2 um, and up to a certain size. And as we see in the command, uh, of course, we, we'd have to do a bounce check here, which I don't do in this code because it's just an example. Um, because otherwise uh, we might overwrite the UTCP. The UTCP is limited in size, and there is a constant in L4, which is kind of L4 UTCP message register size or something, and that's the maximum of uh, amount of bytes you can send through your UTCP in one IPC. Um, and then basically we increase index by the amount of size, and then after here, index basically counts the number of integer values we want to send. Then we can perform a system call, which works the same way I showed you last time. Uh, we create a message tag describing the message, and the message basically gets a protocol ID, which is foo, um, and it gets the index, which is the number of items to copy, and the rest is zero because we're not sending anything more than just uh, the, number, the direct copied words. And the last line then performs a 4 IPC call, which is the uh, system call wrapper for performing an IPC. We hand in the destination capability, our current UTCB, the tag we just created, and we say that we want to have a 4 timeout never set, which means um, to wait to block sending a message until the receive is ready. So that's how you write IPC code. And unfortunately, this is not really nice, because if you have a look at that, then there's a lot of repetitive tasks you need to perform in order to send a message. And this is unfortunately really boring if you do it for a real service. Um, and of course, it's also error prone because uh, if you're writing 20 different functions performing some kind of remote procedure call, then you're most likely to start doing copy and paste programming and then you're going to do some errors because uh, in some functions the parameters are different from other functions and you miss something out there and um, it's really hard debugging that stuff and it's not fun. So the good news is this can be automated and in the field of distributed systems, for instance, where we have also have remote procedure calls across computers, um, there is something called interface definition languages or IDLs and these IDLs basically provide a high-level description of the interface the server is going to provide to its clients. And it looks like this, so we specify an interface which has a name, and then the interface is a list of functions provided by the service. So in this example, we have an interface called foo that provides a function called op1, and op1 gets an integer argument and a buffer argument, and this, uh, there's an additional attribute here saying that this buffer has a specific size, and this size is the third parameter called R2 size. So it's kind of a very high-level expressive format of saying what kind of functions you provide. You can think of it like C++ classes with some additional attributes. And uh, the whole idea of interface definition languages is then that you have an IDL compiler which uses this definition language to generate the code for you so that you don't have to write it yourself. Um, we had this for a couple of versions of F4, and it was called the Drops IDL Compiler, or short DICE. Uh, however, our IDL Compiler at the moment is out of service, so you won't get uh, this feature. Um, the problem with that was, basically, why we're, why we're discontinuing it, is that the IDL Compiler actually grew larger than the whole kernel, because of all the different things you need to consider and all the optimi optimizations you can do when generating this code. Um, it become really, really large and the guy who did the IDL compiler uh, at some point finished, finished his PhD and left our group and no one else was there to maintain it. So that's why we're not using it anymore. Um, however, there is another way of um, kind of easing your efforts of uh, sending IPC messages and this is integrating it with the programming language you're using. And 
both L4RE as well as the Genome user environment, which uh, you're going to learn about later in the summer school, um, provide a framework that allows you to use C++ stream operators to access your UTCP and set messages, which kind of um, makes your implementation a bit, still a bit um, repetitive uh, in terms of uh, calling different functions. However, it makes your code or your IPC messages, messages look like uh, native C++ code. And this, if, you're, if you're programming C++, this kind of uh, comes more naturally. And the stream library, which we provide you with, so where you basically stream in uh, your data and then it will map this to write into the UTCB and you can then use the UTCB to call, uh, send a message um, abstracts actually from the underlying kernel. So you simply see an object called an IPC stream and use, use C++ stream operators to write and read to the stream and uh, you actually do not need to care about the way system calls are performed below. You can have a similar implementation, for instance, using TCP sockets and simply send it over the network um, as you could have one that's using fiasco system calls. Um, IPC streams are heavily used, used in Gnode and in Gnode actually you will also see that this is used for different kinds of messaging or of transport layers, whereas in a fiasco we really use it for fiasco IPC and we don't have any other backend to use. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of code too. Um, the good news uh, again is there has, some, has been some experimentation with an IDL compiler for C++ streams as well. So uh, it might be that at some point we're going to get something where we specify an interface using IDL and then we can run this IDL compiler and it's gen then generating us code using the streaming interface and uh, then you don't need to do anything anymore at all. However, right now you still need to write some code yourself and here's how it looks like. Um, if you're using streams as a client, then basically we have our foo up one again, which is the same um, function as in the example I showed you before. Um, and instead of directly accessing the L4 UTCP and writing to the UTCP message registers and so on, we now create an object of the type L4 IPC IO stream. Um, and then we use C++ streams to stream in our data. So first argument again is an uh, opcode, then we write the integer argument, and then we write a buffer cons uh, which consists of this pointer for the buffer and its size, which is pretty similar to C code I showed you before. However, here the IO stream implementation will uh, take care of putting the arguments at the right places in the UTCB, and you don't have to not ha have any knowledge. Um, the IO stream will also perform a bounce checking, so it will prevent you from overwriting um, the uh, IPC buffer. And what you then need to do once you're done with writing data into your IO stream is you need to perform your call, simply calling a method named call uh, on this object. And then you can perform some error checking. And if, the, if there was no error in this call, then you can use a stream read operator to obtain the result from your function. It's pretty much uh, the native way of doing any kind of C++ communication and it nicely integrates with IPC across tasks. Um, at the server side, things become a bit more difficult because servers do all the work, so they have to do a bit more. Um, at the server side, usually you have some kind of a class, foo, for instance, which implements your interface. And um, this function, or uh, this class will then have a function called dispatch. And dispatch is the um, function that's entered whenever a message arrives in the server, and the server is then responsible to figure out what he's actually going to do. And this function receives an I.O. stream again, and a message check, and the first thing the server does is it can use this uh, user-specified protocol um, to figure out whether this really was a message intended to be sent to him. So it's kind of an additional layer of error checking before you start interpreting the data in your UTCP. And if you figure out that this is not your protocol used, then you simply don't use it, or you simply don't go on uh, parsing the arguments. Um, and then if you figure out that this is really a message that's supposed to be sent to you, um, then you take your I.O. stream and read out first the opcode, and then depending on the opcode you do different things. So it's like a huge switch, switch statement uh, depending on the opcode and then you perform certain things. So for instance, if you find a foo of one in your opcode, then you know there is an integer argument and a buffer argument, 
And so you read out an, the integer argument and the buffer argument that do something with it, and then uh, set the return value or write the return value into the stream again. So again, this is integrating IPC with C++ without uh, specific knowledge about how IPC is implemented in the underlying kernel. Um, the F4 runtime environment provides you with a framework to perform IPC and to build clients and service, because that's what a runtime environment is supposed to do. It's going to uh, take some uh, heavy work from you and provide you with functions that do it. Um, the implementation of this uh, IPC framework can be found in the code you already checked out, at least I hope, um, which is an F4 package, CXX, lib, lib IPC include. And this directory contains implementation of both uh, the C++ IPC streaming uh, interface, which is an IPC stream, and a, fr a framework to implement IPC service in C++, which is an IPC server. Also, there are some examples. Uh, um, there's a client-server communication example which you might want to have a look at in a four package examples client serve. Um, the server inf the infrastructure provided by the runtime environment consists of a set of C++ classes that help you with the tasks you commonly need to do uh, when you implement service. And this, these handle the basic reception of a message with uh, all kinds of error handling you don't need to care about. And it also handles creation and management of so-called server objects, which are kind of the interfaces you provide to other, um, to your clients. And so here's a short walkthrough through the uh, objects you can find in the framework. And I'm going to ex explain you a little, but I urge you to have a look at the examples and have a look at the code to get a better understanding of what's going on. Actually, there's also documentation in this specific part of our book, so you might want to use that. Um, the first basic object is an F4 server, and this object implements a fundamental server loop. Because if you're implementing a server, then this is, the server is doing nothing more than uh, in an infinite loop, wait for a message, read this message, handle this message using some kind of dispatch function, and then send a reply. And uh, a server object encapsulates this whole loop of receiving a message and you don't have to care about the receive part, you don't have to care about sending the reply. The only thing you need to do is to implement the dispatch function for the server. So when you implement a C++ server based on FORE, then you implement your own class which is derived from the L4 server class and you only implement one function in there which is the dispatch function and then you're done. Um, you can have a look at the implementation if you're really curious. However, uh, so far, just believe you can also just believe me that whenever a message is received, the dispatch function is called for a server, and then you can handle it. Um, and there are also additional uh, template parameters for the F4 server class, which you might want to look at if you're really curious. Um, and these template parameters allow you to certain uh, specify certain handler functions. Uh, that are called whenever something is happening in the server. So, when, for instance, when the server encounters an IPC error, you can specify a handler function that is handling this IPC or error that gets notified about it. Um, you can have a similar thing for whenever a timeout occurs, and you can have a template function or a template parameter specifying a function that is called whenever the server is going to wait for the next message. So, you can perform some additional setup. However, um, in the assignments I'm going to give you, you can get away with simply using L4 default loop hooks and you're done and don't need to care about what kind of template param parameters go into this server class. Um, once we have such a server, what we now get is we have something that's waiting for messages and handling them. However, we still need a way of kind of representing the functionality that's going to be called whenever some message arrives. And this is what server objects are for. Um, server objects encapsulate the behavior or the actions that should be performed when a certain uh, function or yeah, RPC-like function is called at your server. And these server objects may, for instance, be used to uh, store a certain state across functions. So usually when you implement a more complex system, then your server is implementing some kind of a state machine and this state machine requires you to store certain data across calls. 
And this is what server objects are for. And server objects are fundamentally a wrapper for an IPC gate. So every server object is represented by a dedicated IPC gate or a communication channel you can use. Um, however, again, the framework takes care of managing the capability for you and you don't have to care about it. Um, the only thing you do is you implement all kind of um, protocol or all kind of uh, state machine your server app object needs to implement. And this is again done using a dispatch, dispatch function. However, in turn, uh, this dispatch function now is not per server, but per server object. And um, this means you can have different server objects or different clients, and they can even implement different kind of functionality in the same server. Um, however, we run into a problem now, because it, when I explained you the server on the last slide, um, I told you there's a dispatch function that's called whenever a message arrives. However, now we have another interaction, because we, have diff we may have different server objects, and these server objects may differ in their implementation and what they do, and we want to um, call the dispatch function of a certain server object and not only of the, the single server you have. So the question is now, how do we decide which dispatch function do we call when a message arrives? And we need another functionality for that, which is uh, a registry. And this registry is basically a store for all the server objects that are used in your server and that helps you then to find uh, a server object that is responsible for handling a certain message. Um, so the general thing when implementing a, an IPC-based server is you create your server and then um, at runtime you create server objects for every client you want to talk to and you store these objects in a registry and uh, the server implementation then uses a function called find, which is provided by this registry. And this uh, a find function will take some kind of ID. Um, and for this ID, return the server object that's responsible for handling messages for this ID. So it's just another layer of indirection so that you can have implement multiple objects within one server. Usually, um, the ID that is used for finding this uh, object is the label of the IPC gate through which a message arrives. So you know, you wait for a message specifying your UTCP, you can receive an arbitrary message sent to any channel that your thread has been, has been bound to, and you can then distinguish the messages by the label of the IPC gate that has been used. And this is exactly um, the ID that is then being used to look up the respective uh, server object in your server. Um, the basic registry I'm showing you here is really very basic, so there is no management uh, of IDs and you don't get any errors if you store objects with different IDs and so on. And uh, this is usually enough to implement basic services. And for instance, it's um, a common uh, design pattern you will find across the services uh, implemented in F4RE is that this label is basically used uh, as a pointer. So you create a C++ object and you create an IPC gate uh, to communicate with this object. And as the label for this IPC gate, you use a pointer which is valid locally to your function. And this makes looking up the uh, object pretty simple because then uh, the ID you get is already a pointer which is valid in your edge space. And the find function will simply return the ID because you're already done and you know that there is a server object at this point. However, it's kind of sophisticated, you need to be careful with what you're doing and you need to, for instance, not interpret this pointer in another address space. Um, but there is some additional functionality which makes handling a bit easier. Um, and there's an additional uh, or an, an accept, wait, I'm missing the word here, an extended uh, registry or the object registry provided by the F4 runtime environment, which is a class derived from the basic registry and provides some additional fu functionality. And this fu additional functionality allows you to add new IPC gates to handle at runtime, which is something if you, uh, you need if you want to perform uh, dynamic session creation. Um, and it also allows you to uh, have uh, server objects bound to names you specify in your Lua initialization script. This is something I haven't told you about so far, but I'm going to do this soon. So, so far in your example code, um, you booted Fiasco and ran single application, which was Hello World. Um, however, in a 
usual scenario, you're going to have multiple applications, and these applications need to be connected through some kind of channels, and there's a bit of complexity in setting the system up. And this is done using init scripts uh, written in the Lua programming language on our system. And this is what this point is referring to. And uh, the object registry allows you to simply register server objects and map them to key channels that have been provided to you uh, during the setup. Um, so here's an overview of uh, the object hierarchy you're going to use if you're implementing an L4RE-based server. You're going to have some kind of uh, server object that is derived from both a server and the L4RE util registry server, because the registry server is actually a server uh, associated with a certain object registry. And then you, as the server implementer, implement a bunch of server objects which are registered at the registry and the registry server will then make sure that whenever a message arrives for your server object, then this server object's dispatch method is called. Um, I know that this may be a bit complex, and you don't need to understand all of that, what I told you. Um, there are examples in the code, and uh, simply looking up, uh, at the examples and trying out a couple of things will help you pr pretty more than just listening to me explaining things. Um, so, here's a short walkthrough anyway how you implement a server. So you declare a static object named server or whatever, and it should be of the type F4RE util registry server because this is this server associated with the re uh, object registry. And then you implement um, a session factory if you want uh, dynamic sessions. If you don't need dynamic sessions, you can simply leave the session factory away. And then you simply implement either your session server dispatch function or you uh, start implementing server objects which implement their own dispatch function and you use the registry to register your objects. And what you then need to do, so basically your server objects implement dispatch and this is the function that's going to be executed at the server side. And what you then now need to do is you're going to implement clients and servers you need to somehow connect them. And I already told you that we have initialization scripts for that and they are implemented in Lua. And things are going to be a bit different to the boot setup I showed you in the last lecture. Oh. So in the last lecture, uh, we had a modules list entry to boot our setup, and this where was something like boot task mo dash dash init equals rom hello, where we said, I want to directly boot this hello um, application and run it. In addition, or instead of this dash dash init option, we can also simply pass a file as a parameter to mo, which is the root task. And this is then a Lua initialization script, which is interpreted by someone else then, by another application. Um, and basically what, what this says is, uh, I want to initially boot the root task, Mo, and Mo should then make sure that this Lua initialization script is run. And in order to do so, we also need to put this Lua initialization script as one of the modules below in the modules list entry, of course. Um, so here's how initialization in Lua works. So this is the most simple script to do the same thing we did previously. Simply start rom hello without any, any additional things. And yeah, one thing is you need to import a Lua package, which is the L4 library, some kind of uh, Lua library we provide you with, and it, which provides you some interface to L4 services. And one of the F4 services you interface with is the default loader, which is a binary loader, which, is, which can take an ELF binary and create an application running this ELF binary. And then you can say f4.default loader start, um, pass an empty array in here, and the name of the binary you want to start, and this is going to run Hello World for you. However, uh, so okay, I already told you about the default loader, sorry. Um, so there is a default loader in the F4 library, and it can parse any arbitrary ELF executables. You can also override this default loader and use your own implementation, for instance, if you want to load Windows PE binaries instead of ELF binaries or something like that. Um, and the uh, arguments to these functions uh, are two parameters, basically. The second parameter is easy because it's the name of the binary to launch, and the first parameter allows you to specify an environment for this application. However, we don't need to specify anything here, but I'm going to show, show you an example now that is uh, more sophisticated. Um, let's talk about client servers. Uh, this example is taken from the client server example which you're going to find in the code. And there we connect um, 
a client, uh, exactly one client with exactly one server. So we need one communication channel between the two. And here's how it is done in Lua. So first thing is we take a shortcut, we take a local variable and map it to a, a 4.default loader, which is simply to, so that we don't have to write a 4.default loader all the time, but simply can use LD. And then in the first step, we call, create another Lua object, calling a function called new channel. A uh, new channel does what the name suggests. It creates a new IPC gate, um, but does not bind anyone yet to it. So it's just a kernel object which no one can use yet. And then we uh, start two applications here. So we're calling loader start twice. First we start the server, then we start the client, and we pass in some additional parameters here. And this is the environment I was talking about on last slide. And the first thing here is there is uh, some uh, variable saying caps equals some list of assignments. And this is one part of the environment, which is an additional list of capabilities that are passed to the application. I told you that when you launch an FRE application, it will already uh, get a bunch of uh, capabilities so that it can start doing something useful. And th these capabilities are always there regardless of what you specify in your Lua initialization script. However, the Lua initialization script allows you to add some additional capabilities to this initial set. And this is what you do with this caps table. So you simply write caps, which is the keyword for this capability array, and then you write a table. So tables are the Lua's equivalent of arrays. And um, you put this in uh, parentheses, and then you have the, uh, the common syntax of name equals something. Um, and this name here is simply a name, and that's the name your uh, application later at runtime will use to get access to this server or to this object. And the other thing is some kind of Lua object you want to use. And in this case, it's the server, which is uh, the channel we created on the previous slide. Here it was called the server. Um, and we're calling the SVR function here. And this is because Again, I told you IPC channels in L4 are unidirectional, and we need to specify who is going to listen on an IPC channel and who is going to be sending to it. And this is what we do using this function. Um, by calling the server function on this newly created channel, we say that uh, this application should receive the server end of an IPC gate, which in the end means that the thread running in there is going to be bound to this uh, IPC gate and will be able to receive messages on it. So what we have here is we have a name and we bind this name in this task capability space to a communication channel. And we do the same thing down here with, uh, without calling the .svr function. And this is for the client. And for the client we simply say count server in the client's namespace should be mapped to the send end of the IPC channel. Um, and there's some, something fancy in here as well. There, there's another environment option called log, and log simply modifies the way your output, whenever you use print and outputs or whatever in your application, uh, goes to your serial line. And it takes two parameters. The first parameter is a prefix, so all output you send will be prefixed with the string. And the second parameter is a color, which allows you to have uh, multiple colors in order to easily distinguish your applications. And it's just really a convenience feature. It doesn't do anything that you really need, but it makes your output a bit uh, more easy to read. Um, so now that we specified this uh, or implemented this Lua script, um, here's what you do when requesting an external object in your server then. Um, basically what you need is, again, a capability, because capabilities are like the wrappers or references to communication objects. And I told you that in the Lua init script, we specified that a certain name is mapped to a communication object here. And in order to obtain a reference or a capability to this object, you use a function provided by your environment. So this is again the function uh, accessing the L4re environment. Uh, there's a function get cap here, which takes a string as a parameter. And this is exactly the string uh, we used in the Lua init script. So if we go back one slide, we use the name calc server here. And so in order to get access to this communication object, you would pass in calc server as a name here, and it would return you with a capability to this object. And get cap and a for cap 
are again template functions because they so they allow you to have capabilities with certain types. Um, but you can also ignore it if you don't want to uh, go into C++ templates here. So and then what, what you can do is you can perform, uh, call a function on this cap object called cap dot is valid. This will figure out if this lookup was okay and if you got a valid capability. And if this is the case, then you can simply use this capability and be done with it. So I know this has been a lot of information on IPC and how to use it, and you're going to explore this in more detail in your uh, assignment today. Um, the most important advice I can give you here is, in addition to the slides, please have a look at the examples provided with our code. Um, the examples might not yet be checked out if you uh, follow the uh, checkout and build instructions from the website. So if, so if this is not the case, then simply go to the L4 PKG directory and do an SVN app examples, and then you get whole, the whole directory. And there are a lot of programs in there which demonstrate different features of the kernel, like how do I do certain system calls, how do I use certain kernel objects, how I do IPC between a client and server. And it's really educating having a look at this code and trying to figure out what's going on there. So this ends the first part of my lecture. Yeah, in the second talk, the time, the part, I'd like to talk about memory management. And um, in order to understand what's going on, let's have a short look at what's happening when we boot Fiasco. Um, well, first of all, the hardware stuff goes on, so the BIOS initializes your hardware platform and then figures out where the boot sector is and starts whatever is there. And usually you have your um, kind of bootloader such as grab in there and the grab, grab will then load your kernel and your multi-boot modules and put them into memory at some point so that the kernel can then start itself and start uh, loading the modules. Uh, this is the step we skip in QMU because the make QMU target kind of simulates uh, until the point where the bootloader has already put in the multi-boot lab modules without running grub uh, at all. Um, the first L4 application that's running when you boot the system is called Bootstrap. And Bootstrap is there to load the real Fiasco kernel. So Bootstrap is kind of like a third stage uh, bootloader that takes multi-boot binaries containing uh, the Fiasco kernel as well as some other multi-boot binaries puts them into memory to a point where Fiasco finds them then and sets up a kernel info page which is kind of providing certain information, kind of what kernel you are using, um, where the system call code is, and so on. And then at some point passes control over to the real Fiasco kernel, who then runs as the kernel. Um, the whole reason why there is this intermediate step of having Bootstrap run before Fiasco is that I showed you in the first lecture that there are a couple of different uh, F4 kernels. And the idea behind Bootstrap is that you can boot an arbitrary kernel using Bootstrap. However, in reality, we only use Fiasco in our group, so it probably doesn't make too much sense, or so it's more like a historical grown necessity that we're still using this approach. So, but you don't need to mind that. Um, what you're seeing is that at some point Fiasco initializes and starts, and uh, Fiasco starts uh, two applications, always. Uh, one is called Sigma Zero, which is kind of part of the L4 specification. And the L4 specification says when you launch, launch an L4 kernel, then there is a uh, user level application called Sigma Zero, which is started as the first application and which gets access to all hardware resources in the system. So Sigma Zero is the fundamental L4 resource manager. And then on top of that, Fiasco starts another application called Mo, which is the root task which is the um, L4 RE style resource manager. So there's the basic L4 level way of managing resources and then on top of that we have Mo, which forms resource management in the L4 RE style. Um, and then Mo does whatever you tell it. So either start one application or use an init script to start other applications. And this basically means allocating a new task or a new address space. And then inside this address space, you need some kind of layout because um, you're running threads in there and these threads need some kind of code and data and they need a stack to run on and this needs to be allocated at runtime at some point. Um, the data and code segment usually come from the binary you're running because they're directly as sections inside the binary whereas uh, the stack is something that you dynamically allocate 
once you have set up a dynamic memory allocator. Um, so the, the basic setup is we have Fiasco booted, we have Mo and Sigma Zero booted, and we're now launching a new application, which has a fundamentally empty address space apart, except for the highest one gigabyte, at least on a 32-bit system, which is the kernel area, which is simply the kernel memory mapped into all applications, uh, an approach which is pretty identical to what Linux and Windows are doing as well. So, um, we're now starting a new uh, creating a new task, we're starting as the initial thread, and set this thread to uh, the stack pointer and in, uh, instruction pointer that have been specified in the binary, or you know, the instruction pointer comes from the binary, whereas the stack pointer is set to some initial thing that comes from more. And then this thread starts running, and something is happening. And this is the thread, of course, takes its uh, instruction pointer and tries to access the address um, of this instruction in order to read it. And the problem is there is no mapping in here. So we know there should be data, stack, and code somewhere in this address space. However, there is no real memory mapping right now. And so we're hitting a fault. So uh, this fault we're seeing then is a CPU exception. Um, and more specifically, this is CPU exception number 14, which is page fault. And this CPU exception tells us that you're trying to access a virtual address that does not have a valid translation to a physical address. So there is no page table entry uh, in your currently loaded page table for this address. Um, and the CPU exception is then delivered in kernel mode, because this is a privileged thing and you need some privileged handling for that. And the kernel has something called an interrupt descriptor table, which figures out what function to execute upon uh, a certain exception. And this interrupt description table will have an entry for this page fault CPU exception and call a handler function, which is a page fault handler. The page fault handler would then set up a new page table entry, figure out what's going on, and so on. Um, the page fault handler, however, needs to implement a policy. And this policy is we need to make a decision on where to take the memory from that I need. So which physical page do I take and map it to the, the uh, faulting task's virtual memory. And this decision, of course, is a policy. And if you, if you think about the clean design paradigms of microkernels, then policies should never be implemented in the kernel, but would, we would like to defer them to user-level uh, handling. And so uh, we'd like to have a user-level implementation of this policy decision. However, we have the problem that uh, page faults and the modifications to page tables need to be done by the kernel because they are privileged uh, operations on x86. So we need to have handler in the kernel and if we want to make a new entry into the page table we also need to do this in kernel and cannot have a user level application do that. So we are having some kind of an issue here and this issue is solved um, by uh, deferring the decision to user space um, and this is where the exception IPC feature comes in I was talking about before. So we have our empty address space, which has an instruction pointer pointing somewhere in here. And by accessing this instruction pointer the first time, a page fault is raised. So we end up in the kernel, and the kernel has a page fault handler. And the idea now is that uh, Fiasco translates this page fault exception into an IPC message sent to another user-level thread that is responsible for handling this. And in case of page fault handling, this page fault IPC message is sent to a thread called the pager. And the pager is a thread that is assigned uh, to handle page faults for a certain other set of threads. So if you think in a photon, every thread that's running on a form has an other thread assigned as its pager. And whenever the th this thread raises a page fault, uh, the page of thread gets notified and ca can take action uh, up on the page board. Um, let's move on. How does it work? So basically, we had our page fault in here, and the kernel now sets up a page fault IPC message. And this is sent to the pager, which may run in another address space, which also may run in the application address space, that doesn't matter. Uh, the only thing we see here is the kernel sends this message, and this message contains. Um, the virtual address on which the uh, page fault occurred. It contains the instruction pointer, 
um, that calls this uh, page fault and it contains information such as was this a read or a write access to memory. And the pager is then notified using this message and can act upon it. And what it does is basically the pager takes some chunk from its memory and establish, uh, says this is the memory I want to map into the application's address space. So um, the assumption is that the pager always uh, already has memory, accept, memory map at some point um, and then takes a, a subset of its memory and makes it accessible to uh, the application that was raising the page fault. And this works by first the pager finding out which area it wants to map. So for instance here this blue rectangle. And then replying to the page fault message sent by the kernel using uh, another message saying I want to map a certain set of pages which are in my virtual memory. And the kernel then uh, figures out that this message contains such a mapping um, adapts the page tables of the target address space accordingly and once it's done with that, resumes execution in the application's address space. Because then, uh, we did the second privilege thing, we modified uh, the page tables down in the kernel and thereafter we know there is a valid mes uh, mapping between, uh, uh, for the virtual address the page fault ra was raised on and so we can resume execution in the application. And this is how page fault handling works. So, you raise a page fault, it ends up in the kernel the kernel notifies your pager, the pager figures out what um, mappings need to be established, replies to the kernel, the kernel uh, adapts the page tables and then resumes execution of the faulting thread. Um, in order to be able to uh, send uh, a memory region to another application, we need to uh, describe this resource somehow. So memory is some, just an arbitrary resource and we need to specify that we want to make a certain subset of this resource accessible to someone else. And this is done using a special data structure um, in Fiasco. Um, and this data structure is a flex page. And this flex page describes a region in memory, fundamentally saying this is the address where the region starts, this is the size of the region, and some additional rights. And the kernel, uh, or wait, the, the pager puts this um, flex page descriptor into the buffer registers when replying to the IPC. So we know the UTCB has this uh, set of buffer registers which contain resource mappings, and um, flex page descriptors are there to actually describe such resource mappings. And when, once the uh, reply is sent, uh, the kernel figures out that there is a valid um, buffer entry in the buffer registers and then starts interpreting the buffer, uh, buffer entries. And so for instance, figures out this is a memory mapping from a certain region in the sender's address space and so uh, starts adapting um, the receiver's address space uh, or the page tables based on the description inside this flex page. Um, the good thing is, now we can implement the policies on how to replace or how to map memory in user space. However, we have some kind of a chicken versus egg problem because I told you every user level thread has another user level thread assigned as its pager. So um, the problem is, who is the pager of this thread? And this thread will have another pager who is mapping memory and there's another one and another one. And we need some kind of route that's actually um, able to so serve all the requests at some point. And this uh, root in our system is sigma zero, the initial pager, because sigma zero gets the whole address or the whole physical memory mapped into its virtual memory during startup. So sigma zero will never raise a page fault, page fault and can therefore serve as the pager for the next layer and the next layer and the next layer of um, uh, other threads and tasks that are running in the system. Um, the cool thing is that these user level pages can now implement arbitrarily complex management policies. So if you want to have your fancy new page replacement algorithm based on working sets and at least recently used counters or whatever, you can implement it in uh, user space and you don't need to care about what's going on in the kernel because the kernel will simply see there's a memory mapping and establish a new virtual uh, uh, page table entry. Um, however, in the basic services, you don't want any complex management. Instead, you want to be really simple in the fundamental system services because the fundamental system services should be fast. 
And the solution to that problem is you can actually stack paging into hierarchies, which makes your system look like this. So first we have Fiasco down at the bottom, and we have the initial address space, Sigma 0, which has the all physical memory mapped. And then we can uh, create a hierarchy of pages on top of it. So for instance, we could have two pages in the beginning, which each get a share of the physical memory mapped to it. And these may spawn other applications, which then get subsets of the memory assigned to each other. Um, we can build a whole subtree or a whole tree of uh, memory mapped and uh, accounted for uh, using such a system. And the good thing is, for instance, that pager one and pager two are completely isolated. They could spawn children that are isolated from each other again, uh, making sure that they never get to see each other's uh, memory. However, we can also implement sharing, which we see up here. So we have this application on top right, which gets some memory from pager 2 and some memory from pager 3, um, mapped into its address space. And at this point, the tree is basically uh, merged again. So the, the tree is not necessarily a complete tree. We can have uh, shortcuts or points where sub-branches of the tree merge again. Um, which brings us to another problem. Because if we have a look at here, um, let's see. So we have this application, which is a task. And it has two regions in memory. And those regions come from different pages, which is a problem because a thread running in this application can raise a page fault, and this thread has only one pager assigned. And what do I do now if I have regions coming from different sources? If a thread raises a page fault, do I send this page fault to pager two, or do I send it to pager three? I don't know. So um, the problem here is, how does the kernel know which pager is responsible for handling a page fault? Because the kernel only thinks the thread has a single pager, and this pager should be it. But how do I configure the system so that the kernel knows who is responsible to what? Um, the good news is every problem in computer science can be solved by adding another layer of indirection. And this indirection in our system is called the region mapper. Let's see how that works. So, um, Every application in the F4 runtime environment has a single thread running inside it, which is the pager for all other threads in this application. And this thread is called the region mapper. And the responsibility of the region mapper is to manage a view on the ad uh, address space layout of this task. So if we have this application over here, um, it can have a layout consisting of several regions, um, which are somehow distinct and which are served by different pages, in this case, pager 1 and pager 2. And the region mapper is a thread running in the same address space and managing a table that stores which region needs to be served by which pager. Um, and using this region map, I can then um, solve this uh, sharing issue. Um, yeah, so let me move back. So, all other threads running in this application get the region mapper assigned as their pager, which solves the interface problem. So Fiasco then knows that every thread has a single pager, which is the region mapper thread in here. And the region mapper gets notified whenever another thread in this address space raises a page fault. And the region mapper can then have a look at the address the page fault was raised at and figure out, OK, that's some region inside my uh, region map and figure out who the real pager um, for that region is. And then can the, the region mapper can redirect the page fault to whatever uh, pager is responsible for the respective region. So this is the indirection we introduce in order to get more flexibility. Um, so I already told you that all threads in the task have the region manager assigned as their pager. And page, the region manager sees all those page faults. Um, but now, what, what the region manager needs in order to achieve this page fault reflection is it needs some way of um, generically obtaining memory. Because the, the real practical reason I want to have this multiple pages is that I want to have different sources for memory. I want to have physical memory, device memory, file systems maybe with providing memory mapped files and so on. And uh, the region manager should not be responsible for caring about if he needs to read from a file or if he needs to read something from a network or, some, or whatever. Uh, the region manager should have some kind of a generic abstraction that it can use to manage the address space. 
And this generic abstraction in F4E is called data spaces. Um, um, the whole motivation, again, is that memory can come from different sources. So from binary files, from files at, in general, can be physical memory, network packets, and so on. And what I want for the region manager is that when it sees a page fault, it should simply call the responsible region, uh, page fault handler for this region and obtain a mapping. And it should not be necessary to care about where this mapping comes from and what specific steps need to be taken to get it. And this is where we introduce a generic abstraction called a data space. And the data space only provides a very generic uh, memory functionality. So it provides an interface where you can say, OK, I want to get a memory mapping of a certain subset of pages from this data space into my address space. And um, the detailed implementation of how this memory is filled and where it comes from is then up to a dedicated memory or data space manager that's responsible for handling page faults in this uh, region. Um, so uh, here's how data space management works in F O R E. So you can data you can have an arbitrary data space manager that's providing data spaces, so memory abstraction objects um, from whatever source. And you as an application can obtain the capability to such a data space, and then uh, you still don't have anything. So with only the capability to a data space, you cannot access memory at all. Uh, what you need to do is you need to take this capability and go to your local tasks region manager and tell it, okay, I have this data space capability here. Please make sure that it appears somewhere in my virtual memory space. And what the region manager then does is it takes a look at the data space, sees how large it is, and figures out whether there is a free block in your virtual address space that is able to fit this new data space. And then it returns you the address of this block. And at this point, the region manager has inserted an entry into the region map so that whenever you raise page faults in this region, it knows which data space manager to ask for a mapping. And at this point, the US application can take the address you obtained and can simply start accessing memory and use it as if it was normal anonymous memory or whatever. And the region manager then makes sure that whenever you raise a page fault in this region, the respective data space manager is notified and a mapping is obtained from this data space manager. Um, so putting things together, um, memory management in L4RE is done at user space. And users level applications have this region manager, which is a single thread inside uh, an application's address space, responsible for mapping or for managing uh, the region map, which contains entries for certain regions and tells us which pager, or in case in, in our course, which data space manager is responsible for uh, handling page faults inside these regions. And so here all the memory management abstractions fall together, and this is how memory is managed in all F4RE. And by already booting, or already by booting the Hello application in the last assignment, you already used this whole concept, and uh, I hope it worked for most of you. Um, and it's just to, uh, to see uh, how, it's how it's going. So here's today's assignment. Um, this is some kind of a computer security summer school. So uh, we're going to implement a client-server setup in F4RE, which is doing encryption. Um, for an example of how such things work, and how client servers are done, please have a look at the examples package. Um, I want to, to build a server that's providing two functions. One is encrypt, the other is decrypt. And for encryption, the client sends some plain text to the server and receives the encrypted version. And for decryption, you do it the other way around. The client sends encrypted text and receives the plain text back from the server. Um, it's totally up to you which kind of encryption you use in there and what kind of keys you want to do. You can do it arbitrarily complex. Um, I'd, st I'd probably start with something like ROT13 encryption or something easy. Um, and in the most basic assignment, simply use an IPC interface in order to get acquainted with uh, L4RE servers and server objects and so on. Um, simply send the message and uh, they reply as IPC messages. Make sure to make them small enough so they fit into the UTCP. Um, however, once you're done with that, I'd also like you to have a look at data spaces. So what you could do, instead of simply sending encrypted and decrypted text around, 
uh, would be uh, have an initialization phase between your client and your server, and have the client allocate a new data space in memory um, upon uh, initialization and send it to the server. And then the server can attach it to its memory, and then you can have shared memory between the client and the server, which allows you in the end to store arbitrarily large data uh, and basically exchange messages that are larger than the UTC. So that's the kind of level two assignment if you have time after the first assignment. However, the first part, having encryption, uh, uh, encryption and decryption functionality, will be sufficient for the next assignment where we're going to use this server then. So have it done by Tuesday, please. Um, and on the last slide, I have three more papers for you to read if you fancy. So the first one is uh, a paper by Norman Feskel, actually, who's going to give another talk, uh, or another couple of talks in the summer school later. Um, and Norman Feskel actually implemented uh, this uh, C++ uh, IPC streaming uh, framework for L4. And uh, there's a paper about this framework. Um, the second paper is a paper about uh, the whole concept of managing memory at the user space and handling uh, page faults and this, the whole region manager and data space concept. So there's an introductory, introductory, introductory paper um, called the SOML Framework for Virtual Memory Diversity. And the last paper um, I'd like to point you to is something completely unrelated to L4. Um, it's called uh, Singularity, Rethinking the Software Stack. And Singularity is a microkernel-like operating system done by people at Microsoft Research. And while it's not necessarily related to what I talked about today, it presents some really interesting and cool ideas about using a safe programming language to implement in an operating system and tells you about what you can modify or how things look differently if you don't use C for implementing your kernel. And it's a really cool paper and has really nice ideas, so I encourage you to read it. And well, this already concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.